Right, good morning everyone and welcome to Eleven Zits with Kevin Williams of Survival Skills. It's uh, Monday, uh, it's the 20th of April and we're moving into yet another week of lockdown. I'm uh, looking out the window, it's yet another wonderful day here and uh, I'm sure we'd all be riding if we possibly could um even if we're not working that is um anyway on, on with the show uh, now today i've got a very special one for you uh we are going to be playing back an interview that i recorded a couple of uh, evenings ago with paul varnsbury now paul is a uh, an internationally renowned expert on personal protective equipment ppe and he has been fundamental in working on the standards body which created the CE standards for motorcycle clothing and uh, body armour too. So um, we'll take questions. Um, if you've got questions, remember you can put them into the uh, comment stream uh, by uh, clicking on the comments at the bottom of the um uh, video here um the video is a bit longer than i planned i was uh, expecting to do about 20 odd minutes or so but in fact we have actually run to about 50 minutes so if you can't stay with us uh, all the way through uh, i quite understand that but don't forget you can catch up with the uh, show here on facebook at any time and you'll also be able to find it over on my youtube channel um which is survival skills uk don't forget that all important uk on the end right okay now with no further ado as he says uh, hopefully he's going to uh, just change the screen share which is moderately complicated here um uh, here we go that should be the right one um there's the video already set up to go so i'll set that running and you can hear what paul has had to say about the uh, recent ce standards okay so on with the interview where's my play button sorry just a moment get everything lined up there we are right uh... Right, we're back uh, with uh, an interview. I'm interviewing Paul Barnsbury, who is an expert on PPE. If you followed any of my posts on the uh, CE standard over the years, and I have written quite a few from time to time, uh, Paul has been a source of information for me. We've had a number of email chats over the 
the last few years and Paul's given me some very useful information and once or twice he's picked me up on a factual error too so he's a very useful chap to know and uh, I can obviously say that he certainly knows his onions so we're going to be talking to Paul uh, for a, a, a few minutes I've got quite a few questions for him here and um, I think we'll probably be uh, sticking to this interview for a, a few minutes um, so let me start with the first question, Paul, if you're ready. Um, yeah, now, if I know more away, Kevin. of uh, the CE um, protection uh, for motorcyclists uh, correctly, we need to go back to a chap called Roderick Woods and the Cambridge Standard. Um, perhaps you can run us through a brief history of that Cambridge Standard and what Rod Woods' motives and his qualifications actually were. Yes, yeah, certainly, Kevin. Uh, Dr. Roderick Woods was a lecturer in physiology at Cambridge University uh, and also an enthusiastic motorcyclist. Uh, he'd already published various papers on the subject of, for example, the, the effects of cold stress on motorcyclists' reaction times and the effect this had on safety. Uh, and then he turned his attention to the role of uh, protective clothing in preventing injury. And following the publication of the PPE Directive in 1989, he produced the Cambridge Standard for motorcyclists' clothing so that in the absence of an official European standard, clothing manufacturers could still meet their legal obligations to test and see mark their garments. And Roderick's work to produce the Cambridge Standard involved surveying damaged suits to identify which had protected and which had failed to protect and why. And uh, he, he gathered the data. I don't know if, if that will come up clearly enough, but yeah, that's yeah, some of the, the actual research data in published form. Um, in parallel, he set about identifying suitable laboratory test equipment. He built a new abrasion test machine uh, because none of the existing methods were deemed to be appropriate or adequate. And then he also adapted some other apparatus for some of the other tests. His research was peer reviewed by the American Society for Testing of Materials and published as three chapters in the technical reference book, book I was just uh, referring to, Performance of Protective Clothing, fifth volume. This was in 1996. Uh, subsequently, Roderick tested garments submitted by motorcycle clothing manufacturers, generally from the UK, but also brands from Scandinavia and the Netherlands became involved. Um, SGS UK, part of a global uh, testing verification body, approved Roderick's lab and would issue certificates to any manufacturer whose garments passed the Cambridge Standard. The first manufacturer to CE mark their motorcycle clothing to the Cambridge Standard was BKS Leather in July 1994. And later, the Cambridge Standard provided the basis of the European Standard EN 13595, parts one to four, published in 2002. Right, okay, good, thank you. Um, so, yes, I remember BKS, obviously. Um, so what uh, got you into bike clothing and uh, these uh, clothing standards then? Well, my paternal great-grandfather, my paternal grandfather and my father were all motorcyclists. You know, going back to the pioneer days in the, in the case of my paternal great-grandfather. Um, so it's in the blood. And all I knew at school was that whatever I did when I left education, it had got to be something to do with motorcycles. It's got to involve bikes. That's all I wanted to do. And simply by being in the right place at the right time, I was offered a job working in the retail shop of uh, one of the leading motorcycle leather companies in the UK at the time, Interstate. And then subsequently, I went on to form Swift Leathers. Um, and it was at Swift Leathers in February 1994 that the seeds of my involvement with standards were sown, if you'll excuse the unintentional pun, when I, I started discussions with the Auto Cycle Union about the need for an ACU standard for racing levers. Um, do you ride a bike yourself at the moment then, Paul? Not at the moment, because I've been spending a lot of time in Asia. 
so um, very, very busy living and working out there. And although I've got a, a driving license in China, which is also a motorcycle license, which I'm told is a rarity, um, I've never ridden a bike out there. It, it's too darn dangerous. It, it's, <laughs> it, it's warfare, really, on the roads. And so it's getting better. I have to say, in fairness, it's getting much better. But the price of bikes in China is double what you'd pay here because of all the import duties and taxes, unless you buy a local bike. Um, I've got a short list of bikes I want to own, um, and it's driving me nuts that I don't have a bike. But then again, at the moment, with lockdown, if I had a bike, I'd be equally frustrated not being able to ride it. I'm going to take a few test rides once the lockdown is lifted. Um, so I've got a list. I've got five, five on my list. Okay, terrific. Um, so when you um, when you came over to start being uh, your involvement in um, protective clothing, what what concerns did you have? What was the situation as you found it at that time? I think what first made an impact on me was people would come into the shop. They come in carrying their damaged leathers. Some of the leathers were damaged, but they were intact. The people were fine. They hadn't been injured. That's what the suits were supposed to do. But then there were some other unfortunate souls who walked in, and wherever the suit had vaporized, failed catastrophically, they were also undergoing repairs of their own, whether it was just waiting for their skin to mend or whether they'd have to have surgical intervention. And it just seemed to me, if on the one hand you can have suits that protect, then why can't everyone do it? Um, riders, well, the, the awakening at that time was, well, riders need to be able to tell the difference. It's not always readily apparent, so perhaps they need a method of being able to identify the difference. Yeah, okay, I can uh, I can identify with that, actually. I remember warnings about not buying sheep napper um, yeah, yeah. from markets and making sure it was proper cowhide. But, uh, you know, how a non-expert actually manages to identify the two is not quite so simple. Um, well, that's that independent market fitness for purpose. That's where this whole thing stems from. So... Is it true to say that there was a lot of confusion over the previous CE legislation and the associated standards? Well, I'm, I'm obviously embedded in it, so to me it's crystal clear. But I think a lot of the confusion was, was contrived uh, to make the PPE directive and the standards appear more complicated than they, they truly were as, as justification for brands not testing and certifying their garments despite the fact they continue to promote them to riders as protective. Right, okay. Um, so how does the CE standard, uh, how does that work together with the sort of the Cambridge and the European standards? Because there seems to be a number of different bodies which all kind of uh, seem to be working together, but equally seem to be separate in some way. I think perhaps the, the simplest way to understand the process is to know that there are two separate but interconnected aspects. On the one hand, you've got the legislation. And the legis legislation is what must be done, by whom, and by when. And then on the other hand, you've got the standards. The standards are the how. The how do you meet the requirements of the legislation. Now, quite often, the two get conflated. And that's where a lot of the confusion arises. Um, but I think if, if you can avoid that confusion, if you can differentiate between the legislation and what it means and what it's there for and the standards, the entire process is much easier to comprehend. Right. OK. Um, the Cambridge standard, I, I, I gather that still exists? It does. Um, it's never been withdrawn by Dr. Woods. It can still be used to test and certify motorcyclist clothing. It's an alternative technical specification which satisfies the legislation's health and safety requirements. So the standard satisfies the legislation. So garments approved and certified to the Cambridge standard can be CE marked. Right. The European standards for clothing, gloves, footwear, back chest and, and limb protectors, etc., 
they provide exactly the same function. If an item of motorcyclist's apparel satisfies the technical requirements of the standards, then it can be certified as equally meeting the health and safety requirements of the legislation and be CE marked. Right, I think that makes things rather clearer. Um, but there is one more question I've got on you. Um, the, there are Sometimes we see garments that appear to be approved. Other times we hear about garments being certified. And what does, exactly does that mean? Um, approved or certified could mean the same thing, essentially. Uh, if the item of apparel passes all the, bar all the, the, all the laboratory tests um, and the manufacturer's paperwork is in order, including the product labelling and the instructions, then an EU-type examination certificate can be issued. It's approved, it's certified. Um, the process is that once the manufacturer has gone through testing of their product, their paperwork's in order, that's been checked, uh, and everything's signed off and the product is certified, they then sign what's called a declaration of conformity. This is a document they have to make available to the public. And it's a legal undertaking that all production will be made to the same level of quality. And once they've done that, they've signed that declaration of conformity, they can affix the CE mark to their production garments. Right, okay, I think that clears that up. Um, whilst we're talking mostly about um, abrasion resistant materials today, um, how do you feel about uh, impact protection standards? Are you reasonably satisfied with those? I've recommended several improvements to the limb impact protector standard, that's the N 1621 part one. Uh, and I think what I suggested would actually be a benefit to motorcyclists. Firstly, the current two size range is, in my opinion, inadequate. Uh, even the largest size of protectors, um, I'm talking the elbow and knee protectors primarily here, um, the largest size specified by the standard is too small for a wearer's much above five or eight tall. I've suggested two additional um, bigger sizes, which would result in protectors suitable for wearers up to well over six feet tall. But the industry is opposing this. Um, they're very happy to add one smaller size than the current two sizes for juniors, but they're not supportive of having any larger sizes. Um, to give you a, an idea, someone could buy a, a size 48, 50 inch chest jacket, and they will get probably the same elbow protectors, uh, shoulder protectors as well come to that, uh, that they would get in a size 38 jacket or 40 jacket and it, it just you know it's just out of proportion it's it's wrong and, and i oppose it the other issue with the standard is that materials technology has advanced tremendously since the first version of the standard was published in 1997 now in 2012 when they first revised the standard uh level two was added that had to a higher level of test severity you see, but that was eight years ago. Things have moved on. Um, the standard is currently in the process of another revision. Um, but again, I don't see any interest or any motivation or support from the industry to raise the bar. Um, the common response is that the requirements are minimums and anyone is free to develop a superior product. But the fact is that only specialist companies will generally do this. And the mainstream manufacturers of bike kit won't pay the premium for superior components uh, when there is an abundance of low cost protectors from sources who either lack the technical capability or aren't interested in producing a higher performing product. Obviously, there are exceptions, but that seems to be the reality. OK. All right. So, um, all right, moving back to the clothing then. Um, leaving aside the question of whether or not the kit should be CE approved at the moment, would it be true to say in practical terms that motorcycle clothing could, um, up to the, uh, the changes in the legislation just recently, been divided into three groups? That is, a non-protective garment that is just a barrier to the elements um, and basically offers nothing else. Um, the non-protective clothing that has CE armour in it, 
but again, it doesn't offer you any of the abrasion resistance that riders may expect from it. And then the fully protective gear, which is CE approved for the garment and also carries the CE approved body arm. Would you say that sums up the situation? Yeah, so that's an extremely accurate summary of how things were, certainly under the previous PPE directive. But from 21st of April 2018, so two years ago, um, with the full implementation of the PPE regulation, all motorcycle clothing is deemed to be PPE and must be tested and certified. The sole exception is rainwear, but that must not feature any capability to have impact protectors fitted. So your group of three now becomes a group of two. It's either rainwear and it absolutely cannot accept fitment of impact protectors or it's PPE. Right. Okay. Um, so, all right. Good, quest uh, good question to come for you here. Why is it that manufacturers make clothing which hasn't provided decent abrasion resistance? Because it sells. I mean, hopefully that's going to diminish. I don't, I don't mean that sound very right, but hopefully that situation will diminish as more and more tested and certified clothing reaches retailer shelves. The difficulty is going to be policing online sales. Online retailers are still covered by the PPE legislation, just the same as high street shops, just the same as distributors, importers, and manufacturers. But from my own efforts to try to get eBay to remove ad listings, where motorcycle clothing has been sold using fake documentation, um, you get the impression that these online platforms think they're above the law. Um, there was an article I contributed to in Motorcycle News back in February 2020, um, and that highlighted it perfectly. The article covered fake, unsafe helmets, fraudulently marked, and, and the aspect of the story I contributed to was fake, unsafe back protectors uh, inserted into untested clothing so i think really this this might offend a few people from the platforms concerned um if they're watching this but i think anyone any motorcyclist who think thinking buying bike gear from an online platform like ebay or similar don't well, I've certainly um, flagged up the, the risks of buying counterfeit uh, brake pads, tyres, batteries, uh, spark plugs have all been found by trading standards over the years. So definitely it's something that buyers do to be very careful about. Um, I've seen it claimed that uh, it's, to quote, impractical and too expensive to submit a garment in every size that's manufactured for testing. That was uh, actually something I found online. What's your opinion on that? Well, apart from the fact it's completely incorrect. Only one size of garment is required to be tested. Um, whoever made that statement clearly hasn't read or doesn't understand the standard. The standard only requires, the, the clothing standard only requires one size of garment to be tested. Right, okay. Um, so, all right, another question then. I've, I've also heard that riders groups themselves agree to support the original uh, EN 13595 standards only if leisure riders clothing was specifically excluded because they were, they were fearful that the, the standards would then be used to support compulsory wear of approved clothing. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, I was actually involved in it because I was in charge of the European Standards Project Group responsible for finalising EN 13595. I participated in all the programs for impact protectors, footwear, gloves, but primarily I contributed most to the um, to the clothing standard. Well, because of my past association with the Cambridge standard, um, but primarily, um, yes, the, the document was actually originally one document. The N thirteen five nine five. It's been published in four parts, but originally it was a single document, like the Cambridge standard, but. Um, the industry and riders groups suggested that if it was broken down into four parts, the general requirements, things like the design criteria, and then each of the key test methods, abrasion, resistance, burst strength of seams, impact cut resistance of materials, a four-part standard would be um, 
more of a barrier to the legislators using it as a basis for compulsion. And then they came back uh, subsequently or about the same time with, uh, oh, the other thing is let's make it for professional use only, so leisure use isn't covered. That will act as a double bar to legislators. Now, I didn't entirely see the rationale. It just, it just didn't hold water to me. But if it meant we could get the standard published, instead of the deadlock that they had been up to that point, then fine. Uh, if it makes the riders happy and the industry happy, we're all happy. The standard gets published. Riders get better kits. They get tested and certified clothing. So what's to lose? So that's how the standard went ahead. Um, however, it was short-lived, the, um, the, the value of the, the, this particular, these particular two strategies, because... A year after the standard was published, the General Product Safety Directive was published. And Article 10 of the General Product Safety Directive deals with the migration of professional use products into amateur use. Uh, for example, if you go down to your local B&Q, advertising is allowed on your channel, um, and you buy yourself a, a, a professional Hilti drill, you know, or, or Bosch, or something really expensive, you're only going to knock up a few shelves on your bedroom wall or whatever, but if you're going to do it, you want the proper tools for the job. So you buy a professional drill. Well, under GPSD, um, if it's likely to fall into amateur hands, the requirements, any legal requirements are identical. And so it was with motorcycle clothing. Even though the standard says it was for professional use, if there was a chance non-professional motorcyclists could buy kit made to that standard, and GPSD said the exclusion is irrelevant, and it was. Right, okay. Um, all right, so why haven't we, the riders, then pushed harder? Why haven't we got the manufacturers to achieve standards that uh, have been set for them? Um, is it because riders tend to put uh, appearance over function? Uh well, I think if you ask me, you'll get one view from me, and it's probably something you'd get a lot of other different views from various riders, and it would be interesting to hear their views. Um, maybe it's because some of them think their clothing's already been CE approved, um, especially if they see one of these labels in the garment that relates only to the fitted impact protectors, but which, because of the way it's phrased, causes the owner of the garment to infer that it covers the whole garment. Uh, I think that's something you've touched on before in one of your previous broadcasts. So there is that. They probably think they, they're getting kit that's made to the standard already. What they don't appreciate is it's only the protectors. And the garment itself hasn't been through any abrasion testing. It hasn't been through any seam strength testing uh, or, or anything else. It, it hasn't gone through the panel of tests that a whole garment has to go through. Um, I th but I think the clothing producers, a big, big challenge that's um, facing them as you add safety, you also increase the ergonomic burden on the wearer. So wearing motorcycle clothing on a hot day, it's going to make you feel hotter. Um, it's going to make you sweat even more. But there's no such thing as a magic T-shirt. You're fighting the laws of physics. Um, you can't have this super thin, super flexible, super lightweight fabric that will fend off anything an impact with the slide along the tarmac will present to it. It doesn't exist. I know that's certainly something that uh, Dr. Chris Hurran, who I work with on the Shiny Side Up tours in New Zealand, was keen to point out that the uh, the requirements for a rider in England, where it rarely gets much above 20 degrees Celsius, are very different from those that are experienced by Australian riders. So that's something I hope to come to on a, another show. Um, but can you sum up quickly then how the the old level one, level two performance requirements uh, of the EN 13595 uh, standard match up against the new A, AA, and AAA ratings in EN 17092? Well, they don't match at all. EN 13595 sets much higher requirements. 
On tear strength alone, it's it's double the minimum requirement of 13,595. The minimum requirement is double that of the maximum requirement of uh, AAA classification in EN 17092. So there's one example, the tear strength test. On abrasion resistance, comparison's more difficult um, because EN 13,595 breaks the garment down into four risk zones, whereas 17092 um, has three. And they're apportioned differently as well. So it starts to become a little bit more complicated in, uh, in terms of making comparisons. But as an indication, you mentioned Chris Huron. Chris did some um, work um, where he put the reduction in abrasion test severity from level one of EN 13595 to A classification of EN 17092. The reduction was between 44% and 75%, depending on the part of the body. Um, and for level two of EN 13595 versus AAA, so the two highest levels of each standard, the reduction in test severity ranges from 20% to 71%. But the things of most significance with those drops in uh, test severity the biggest drops occur in the areas of the garment at the highest risk of impact and prolonged contact with the road surface as the rider slides along the tarmac. Right, okay. So um, if we leave aside then the question of whether or not the, uh, the AAA and AAA rating systems are actually appropriate for bike wear, uh, which is something I questioned uh, two weeks ago, um, does it clarify matters um, for the rider by simply enforcing that the manufacturers declare those protective qualities? Well, the, the, the new system has the support of the vast majority of an industry, which under the previous voluntary compliance regime of the PPE directive, that injury was largely ignoring the legislation. Um, under the new PPE regulation, um, well, it's been, it's been enforced since the 21st of April 2018, so I'm not sure what the new still applies. Um, they've got no choice but to comply. But I'd have to say there's definitely been a sea change in attitude from the industry towards testing and certification. And that's actually a very welcome change for the better. How often does a garment have to be retested? Well, EU type examination certificates have a validity of five years from the date of issue, uh, at which point they have to be renewed. That said, the more, with motorcycle clothing, the more likely scenario is that um, very few models seem to remain in a brand's range for that long. By five years, they've already been replaced by something else. So I think in many respects, the validity of a certificate is... Um, is inconsequential but but five years is the maximum duration then they have to renew okay that makes sense um but what happens if the manufacturer changes the specification uh, somewhere along the line of that production run um, does that mean the garment has to be retested it depends on the extent of the change if it's something minor uh they, they have a new zip supplier so they need they need to get the zips uh checked it'll just be a check of the zips that um, some seam strength testing of a zip insertion seam and that'll be a limited check testing um, if they change the basic material from which a garment is made then that's a different story and the likelihood there is they would have to go through test strength abrasion resistance and the seam strength um, uh, and, and perhaps some other tests as well so um, but I think, as I said a few minutes ago, it's it's un, for a lot of manufacturers. I think it's unlikely they're going to change materials unless either they're changing design, so it's a new model anyway, right. or if they have to change supplier, the new factory. Uh, okay. So, um, are any checks made um, to ensure that it's the supplier that isn't uh, changing specifications? 
uh, the manufacturer, usually the brand, is required to provide a detailed bill of materials um, as part of their supporting documentation for uh, the certification of their garments. And um, that will obviously set down everything that goes into making the garment. And the way motorcycle clothing is produced by the major brands requires forward ordering of materials because of the quantities. They can't just go and buy it off the shelf, they have to forward order it. Yeah. So in some respects, it's easier to monitor and control that what was tested in the lab and has been approved is what actually goes into mainstream production. It's in the hands of the brand, but it's in their interest as well to do it. Um, what you could have happen is a brand could change factories, but if a product has a two year lifespan, then for example, they would uh, they'd have factory one in year one and then move to factory two in year two, and they'd have to go through all sort of checks, retesting, and then of course, do the same monitoring to make sure that the, the approved materials make their way through into final production. Mm -hmm. um, and that of course, means check testing uh, even if for example they uh, stick with the same factory and the factory is using the same materials from the same supply source uh, it's good practice to run some annual check tests even if they're just some basic tear strength maybe some abrasion resistance just so that there's a record that um, quality control has been monitored and the other thing to remember is that if you have a material tested and it's used across several different garments or gloves or footwear, then you only test once. You don't have to test once for each style of product. So if you have leather A and leather A is used in seven jackets, the results for leather A are applicable to all seven jackets. Right. So there are, there are economies that the the larger brands with extensive ranges can tap into. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, how do you feel about the Moto Cap independent tests? We talked a little bit about uh, Chris Huron. Um, do you think uh, that th those tests have been too hard on the uh, the European standards? Do you think, in particular, that the AE standard is getting a hard time from those tests? Well, I suppose I have to declare an interest here because I've been involved with work that has resulted in motorcap since before motorcap was really an idea i've been working with academics uh, and uh, various government institutions in australia since 2005. Um, i was also one of the co-authors of the award-winning research paper our stars better than standards which that contributed to the foundations of motorcap so uh, professionally um although not financially, I, I do have an interest in MotoCap because I think it's a very well planned, very well thought out and very well administered and executed scheme with the uh, secret shopper purchasing uh, and so on and so forth. Um, actually, I, in one of your previous shows, I was a little bit surprised at the criticisms from, from the representative of one brand that had found that MotoCap was, uh, what did you say, too complex for consumers. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just thought so when you read that out, I thought, well, what could be simpler to understand than two ratings, zero to five stars for protection, zero to five stars for uh, comfort. Um, you know, I think riders will find that more intuitive than the AAA, AA, ABC um, classification system of the N17092. But... Um, well, that, that, that's riders to pronounce a judgment on. Um, what else can I say about this? I think um, 17092 is a standard, the requirements for which were set by what's currently available in the market, what mainstream products are capable of achieving on test apparatus. Um, that's why in other fora I've referred to it as a rubber stamp standard. That sounds pejorative, but I'll go on to clarify that in a moment. Um, that's 17092. The N13595 
uh, and Motocat come from a different direction. And of course, they've got their origins in the same research. Um, yeah, I suppose the tale here is that the industry knew in 2013, late 2013, that the, the PPE regulation would compel the motorcycle clothing industry to test and certify motorcyclist clothing. Um, when the European Parliament officially announced this in January 2016, that left the industry and the industry members of the European Standards Committee little time to finalise EN 17092, um, given that some of the major brands work two or more years ahead on their design processes. Um, up, up to that point, with the standard, there was a choice of two abrasion and two seam strength tests. But in April 2016, the tests that had been carried over from EN 13595 were dropped and the committee proceeded with the lower stringency test methods. Again, doubling back on what I said a few moments ago, they went with criteria which the garments already in the pipeline could achieve rather than facing the challenge of developing new garments in the limited period available. And there's sense to that because if they'd gone any other way, they wouldn't have been able to put any products on the market from 2018. Motorcyclists wouldn't have anything to wear. How would that benefit anyone? It doesn't. So if you like, in some respects, you have to accept that what they did, whilst it might not have resulted in what I would consider the best way forward, it was expedient, it was necessary. Right, okay. Um, moving off the European scene for a moment and uh, into a peculiarly British problem, um, what do you say to suggestions that uh, the UK will be able to abandon the CE uh, European standards altogether and impose an old style British kite mark standard? Oh, the B word. The B doesn't mean British, it means Brexit. Um, yeah, Brexit. Um, well, the PPE regulation is already enshrined in UK law and has been since 2016, uh, April 2016, pre the referendum. So the PPE regulation is already part of UK law. So um, that's there. It's British law. Um, if as and when should Brexit take place, then for two years, the CE mark will remain valid in the UK. Um, during those two years, a UK CA, UK Conformity Assessment Mark, will be set up. And that will eventually, for the UK market, take over from the CE mark, certainly by the end of two years. Um, after that, I think we'll see motorcycle clothing wearing two labels, UKCA and CE, because it's all being produced in the same factories, in the Far East generally, so I can't see how manufacturers will want to have a different label for the UK market and a different label for the EU27. So I think we'll, we'll get used to seeing UKCA and CE alongside each other. The other thing is the British Standards Institution has made it quite clear it intends to remain a member of the European Standards Body, SEN, and the BSI will continue to contribute to the, to the development of European standards, will keep sending British experts to the European Standards meetings, and will continue to publish the standards that uh, result from that work as British standards. Now, at the moment, if you pick up a European standard in the UK, if you go to the BSI online shop, Google for details, um, if you see a European standard, it's published in the UK as a BSEM. Um, so you'll still see those standards being published. Whether they will drop the EN from the front cover, so they'll just be BS 17092, for example, or whether they'll maintain the EN um, designation, I don't know, but apart from that, the rest of the document will be identical uh, as it is across um, across the EU27. Consequently, I don't see 
motorcycle clothing standards in the UK deviating from the European standards. Right, and of course a uh, supplementary point there would be that anything that is actually manufactured in the UK would it need to be uh, equivalent standard to be sold in Europe anyway. I think if you've got British manufacturers who are selling in Europe then primarily they'll probably be going for the UK CA mark but as the standards used will be identical they'll just be able to make a dual application yeah. maybe even with the same set of documents and get UK CA from a a British certification body and CE from an EU27 based. If you pick the right certification body, one with offices in both jurisdictions, it will simplify the process. Okay. Um, I know you've made the point now that the, uh, the what I've been calling the new standard, because I think that a lot of riders still aren't really fully aware of what's been going on. Um, but how does this, uh, you know, revised standard, let's call it, affect old stocks of level one and level two CE clothing? Um, how about old stocks of, of clothing that was, was not approved? Uh, is there a cutoff point at which these are technically illegal to sell? I'll deal with the second group first, if that's okay, because yeah. any clothing that was first placed on the market, uh, prior to the 21st of April 2018 can be sold in perpetuity even though it isn't tested and certified so if your local bike shop has got some jackets hanging on the rack or if you go to one of the major retailers one of the big chain stores in the UK and they've still got stock that they've had since pre 21st of April 2018 they can carry on selling it that's fine whether it should have been seen marked before to the old legislation that, that argument slaps now, no, forget it, Let, let's look at where we are now. Um, so that, that's the thing, they can carry on selling. Anything that's been first placed on the market after, on or after the 21st of April 2018, well that most certainly is required to conform to the legislation. So it's required to be tested, CE marked to demonstrate that it meets the legislation. That's new stock from 21st of April 2018. Going to the other one, um, EN 13595. There aren't very many brands that um, are offering products this standard. There wasn't a big take up. You've covered this as well, the, the fact that the industry largely ignored it in, in one of your previous uh, shows. So, um, um, you know, a few brands. Um, well, for example, we've mentioned BKS, there's also Hideout, um, both were making to the Cambridge Standard and I think they're both making to the M13595 and all the Cambridge Standard. Um, they, their current certificates, they will remain valid until 21st of April 2023 and then all pre-existing EC certificates under the PPE directive, they will lapse. That's it, 21st of April, 2023. What they have to do is they have to reapply and um, get certification under the new two year old regulation. So um, in terms of business continuity for them, it should be business as usual. It should be a largely administrative function. But uh, so that's it, it's, it's all fairly straightforward. Uh, if, if, you, if you know the system and, and you know the timescales involved, uh, and, and what you need to piece together, then uh, it should be straightforward and business continuity shouldn't be adversely affected. Right, okay. Uh, so, finally, um, we'll come to the million dollar question. If you were buying kit to wear on the road yourself, uh, would you be happy with the A or even the AA standard? Uh, or would you be looking at the AAA classification? Most of the clothing I have, I have a 2005 vintage Halverson's safety suit. Um, declares of interest, that was a product that I had a hand in the development testing certification of. And I still think it's a fantastic piece of riding kit. You know, all season, all weather, fully, well, yeah, it's just amazing. I, I've said so much about it on, on the web in the past. I'm sure if you dig deep enough in Google, you'll find some of my thoughts on the subject. So that would be my primary piece of kit because it's still in excellent working order. I think I just need to get a, a stitching on the waist zip redone and that's it. It's 100% again. Um, 
if, however, I was looking for something else, uh, I'd be looking very closely because if there's an issue with 17092, it's the abrasions test. And the way that it generates data and test results, it seems to group products in a fairly wide band. And the thing is, with 13595, if you put it through the abrasion test, you get a number of seconds. And so if the manufacturer discloses the number of seconds, you can see that manufacturer A, their product lasted 4.1 seconds. Manufacturer B, their product lasted 6.9 seconds. So it's almost at level two. So you know you've got one that's just a level one pass and one that's almost a level two. And that information can help you um, make a purchasing decision. That's precisely what MotorCap's doing in its own way. But with 17092, because the, the end point of the test is when the machine stops and not when the sample fails, and whether the hole is larger than or less than five millimeters, as I say, it, group, it seems to group clothing in a band, and you don't know whether a garment has passed at the bottom of the band or whether it's pretty close to the top and into the next performance level, almost a double A. You don't know because the information is provided by the test. So there could be some A classification clothing out there that is very, very good and it's at the top of the band and almost into the next band, but you'll never know because that information isn't revealed by the test. What would I do? Um, well, because I'm used to 13595, I'd certainly start looking at AAA, but I think with a lot of riders, they're going to look at what suits type of riding they're doing and um, budget maybe. And there's going to be lot, lots of factors that are unique to individual people, but yeah, I mean, I would certainly, I'd be looking at AAA because if I'm going to be out on a bike, I'm going to be riding at motorway speeds, then if that's the highest performance level, um, naturally I would fall towards that. But you see, my benchmark is with the much higher 13,595. Other people may base their decision on a completely different benchmark and set of criteria. It's personal, it's individual. Okay, right. I think we've um, hopefully given the listeners, uh, watchers, viewers, I suppose we're viewing, aren't we? Because we're on screen. Um, <laughs> I think we've given them a a very good insight into how the CE testing uh, system actually works and uh, to you, you, uh, you've been very kind to lead us through your input Paul uh, for which I'm very grateful um, so I've just got one sneaky question which I didn't pro uh, provide you earlier <laughs> what is your dream bike? I said I said there were five on the short list didn't I? Yeah you did. Yeah. Okay um, in that no particular <laughs> oh, uh, I, well, I was going to say no particular order, but if you say that, I think I'll tell you what, what really intrigues me at the moment and attracts me, and I'd like to have a test ride one, is the, the Energica Eva Rebel. It's also the most expensive one on the list. I mean, the others are um, uh, a Tuono Factory V4, a Street Triple, an FTR 1200, and um, uh, the Enfield. Um, I forget which one of the two it is, but uh, the more sporty one. Uh, is it Continental? Uh, Continental, yeah, the GT as well or something, isn't it? I'm a little bit hazy yeah. on the... That, that, that's on the list as well. So that, that's, that's, that's the dream garage or the short list, depending on... Yeah, yeah. But I uh, know the, the Energica Eva Rebel. Um, I've owned uh, a plug-in hybrid car in uh, China and uh, I've driven electric cars over here. Um, and now they've got the range up to, uh, with, with the latest Energicas, so they've got the range up to um, something approaching the tipping point where it really does start to make sense. Yeah, I think I'll have a spin on one of those, and, but it's on the list anyway. Very intrigued by the bike. Excellent, excellent. Right, well, I think we'll leave it at that point. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your input. Um, we will surely seeing you uh, contributing uh, a lot more to the debate uh, you know this is going to run and run and run i can see that um so uh, but, but for now thank you very much indeed paul for your input and i'm sure we're all very grateful to you
Well, thanks for inviting me, Kevin, and thanks to your listeners for listening. And I hope they did find it interesting. If not, play it again when you go to bed if you've got insomnia. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks. Bye bye then. Thank you again. Bye bye for now. Bye. Right, okay, everybody, there we are, there we have it. That's the interview with Paul Varnsbury, uh, the CE expert, um, and he's given you his insights into how the older CE Level 1, Level 2 standard uh, compares with the newer A, AA and AAA standard. Um, I hope you found that interesting. I certainly did. Um I found out some new details for myself. I didn't know all of it, I have to say, um, which kind of really goes to show that, uh, you know, as end users of the product, um, that we really do need to go out there and dig out this information because, you know, quite frankly, we can't rely on the manufacturers themselves to be entirely upfront with it. We, at least we know what the standards of new clothing actually is but we still have to understand what those standards actually mean. And we have to uh, be able to put them into context with what we're hoping that those uh, pieces of riding kit will achieve whilst we're riding. So um, that's it for today. I shall just leave you with a reminder that you can catch up with uh, 11s every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. Um, we'll be back on Wednesday at 11am with the regular show with uh, topical news, controversial views and uh, some biking tips as well. Um, and of course, you can catch up with this uh, particular broadcast if you missed it, either here on Facebook or on my YouTube channel, uh, which is Survival Skills UK. So I um, hope to see you on Wednesday. Uh, certainly hope that you've enjoyed the show today. And uh, do uh, let your friends, your riding buddies, uh, any family members who are uh, into two wheels, do let them know about this interview. Uh, let's try and get the word out there and uh, let as many people know about the CE standards as we possibly can. So bye for now. Thank you once again for tuning in and hopefully see you again on the next show. <laughs>